evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome to our uh, LGBTQIA plus week event this morning, uh, Queer Politics Post-Marriage Equality. Uh, my name is Kenton Westerfield. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. And I am one of our entry advisors here at Highline and a member of our LGBTQIA plus week planning committee. And now I will pass um, the mic over to Doris Martinez for a land and labor acknowledgement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenton. Um, my name is Doris Martinez, your pronouns, and serves as director for Center for Cultural Inclusive Excellence and part of the LGBTQI Plus Week Committee. Uh, today, we take a moment to acknowledge all Indigenous and First People of the land and space in which we live and breathe. For our community at Highline College, we recognize that we are on stolen, occupied, Duwamish, Coast Salish, Muckleshoot, and Puyallup lands, and we want to thank all relations and tribes today as we prepare to hold space as a community. We recognize that all of us are joining this conversations from different locations through Zoom. And so let us also acknowledge the indigenous and first peoples of the land and spaces in which you currently occupy. Further, we respectfully acknowledge the enslaved people, primarily of African descent, who provided and exploited labor on which this country was built with little to no recognition. Today, we are indebted to their labor and the labor of many black and brown bodies that continue to work in the shadows of our collective benefit. And now I will pass it back to Kenton who will introduce today's feature presenter. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Doris, for grounding us this morning. I now have the honor of introducing our presenter for today's session, Queer Politics Post-Marriage Equality. Um, as a lifelong Washingtonian, Marco was born and raised in the communities he has represented in the legislature since 2008. He received a master's in public administration from the Daniel J. Evans School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington. In 2008, Marco was appointed to the House of Representatives, where he won re-election three times. In 2014, he was appointed to the Senate, where he's currently serving his third term as senator. Throughout his service in the legislature, Senator Leas has focused on policies to build an economy that works for everyone and to create strong pathways to education and opportunity while ensuring a focus on equity and social justice for all Washingtonians. Senator Leas held the, uh, uh, sorry, Senator Leas led the effort to protect LGBTQ youth in Washington by banning so-called conversion therapy. He is also focused on tackling the student debt crisis, passing multiple bills, including the Student Loan Bill of Rights, a refinancing program for college debt, and a new low interest student loan program for undocumented students and dreamers. In addition to his service in the legislature, Marco is a college professor teaching courses in American government. Please join me in welcoming Senator Leas to our virtual stage. Yay, thank you so much, Kenton. It's so wonderful to be with you all and uh, such a delight to be part of Highline's LGBTQIA plus week um, to contribute some of uh, my thoughts, but also to just be with you in this wonderful community space. So thank you so much for the invitation. It's such a delight to be with you. Today, I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of the arc of history that we're on. Uh, there's uh, Dr. King has the famous line that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And when it comes to queer politics, when it comes to the rights of LGBTQIA plus people in our country, we are definitely on that arc uh, from a place of um, marginalization, discrimination, legal uh, harassment to today um, in more and more parts of the country, achieving uh, recognition and legal protection. And in 2015, the right, the fundamental right to marry uh, as guaranteed under the constitution. Um, I want to also, and we can advance to the next slide, I want to talk about um, what brought us to that 2015 decision, and then what does the world look like in the aftermath of the 2015 decision, using that sort of as our marker. Uh, for a lot of uh, folks engaged in queer politics, their goal was to achieve marriage equality. They believed that that would mark our full participation as queer people in this society. What we know is that there's still more work to do. And we know that in particular for white, cis, gay men, the marriage equality decision and this movement towards gay rights have really achieved basic acceptance in our society. 
but that acceptance and that participation does not extend to all corners of the LGBTQIA community. And so as we think about the accomplishment, we should celebrate, but also recognize that there's still so much work to do. We see a rise in anti-trans violence and rhetoric. Uh, we see continuing efforts to harass uh, queer people across this country. Um, I also want to take a look back into history. I think uh, part of understanding where we are today, part of understanding where we've come to, requires us to sort of look back and see where we've come from. So let's advance to the next slide. The uh, origins, if you read the sort of dominant storyline of the LGBTQ movement, they will talk about the Stonewall Inn riots in 1969 as the first time that the movement for what was called gay rights at the time um, really burst onto the public landscape and received coverage. But 1969 wasn't the beginning. We know that there were protests earlier in our history, public protests, for example, at Cooper Donuts in Los Angeles in 1959 or at Compton's Cafeteria in San Francisco in 1966, notable examples of queer people standing up for fair treatment and for their rights. But the Stonewall Inn riots were the first ones that got covered on the nightly news and in our newspapers for a sustained period of time. And what brought us to 1969 to those Stonewall Inn riots? We have to go back a little bit further in our history uh, to the uh, decades before that to find the legal harassment of LGBTQIA plus people rising in its intensity. Uh, the state of New York had passed an anti-masquerade law in the 1800s because there were people that were masquerading and committing crimes while in disguise. And so the, the state of New York passed a law against wearing a disguise to hide your crime. That law was used in the 20th century to harass LGBTQIA plus people, in particular used to harass trans people uh, and to harass uh, lesbian women who were wearing what was described at the time uh, men's clothing. There was what was famously in the LGBTQ community called the three article rule. You had to be wearing three articles of clothing that the police believed aligned with your, uh, your gender at birth or you would be breaking the law. And so we would see police uh, not just in New York, but around the country, arresting people because they weren't wearing, quote unquote, um, proper clothing, they were masquerading. In addition, in the city of New York, uh, there was a significant organized crime presence that had uh, aligned with elements of the police department uh, in ways that uh, would benefit both organizations. So the organized crime entities would operate uh, what were technically illegal bars and illegal clubs under the protection of the New York police. And one part of that community was the LGBTQ community. So gay bars, many of them operated by organized crime elements who had protection agreements with the New York City police. And as a result, uh, the police would come through periodically and sweep those establishments, uh, giving notice to the, own, the owners of the bar so they could warn their patrons when those sweeps would be coming. So we could maintain the appearance publicly that the police were targeting uh, bad actors, but uh, they were in league with organized crime elements and giving warning. Well, in 1969, the Stonewall Inn uh, was a gay bar um, in uh, lower Manhattan and was one of these establishments that had a protection agreement with the police department and had been sweeped already a couple of times in June of 1969. And on June 28th, the police raided the bar again. And uh, the folks there were quite frankly, just really angry. They'd been raided, I think two or three days earlier and they were just fed up with this treatment by the police. And in particular, uh, this bar had uh, that night had a, a strong and feisty group of trans women who were just fed up with uh, their treatment, Marsha P. Johnson and others. Um, a, a crowd amassed outside of the bar as the police were raiding it, trapped some of the officers inside uh, the Stonewall Inn. Uh, and what erupted was this riot between a huge crowd of LGBTQIA people and the police that were harassing them. Um, and it started that night, it lasted for several hours on June 28th, 
And then it continued for the next couple of days with LGBTQIA plus people putting their bodies in the way um, of the police and the police brutality refusing to accept this treatment anymore. This spread to other cities uh, in particular, uh, there were other cities that joined into these protests and this launched um, the national coverage and attention of the LGBTQ movement and the movement for gay rights. We can move forward to the next slide. Uh, after the Stonewall Rebellion, two of these uh, leaders of this group of really powerful trans women in Manhattan, uh, Lower Manhattan, uh, came together and became the founders of what they called the Gay Liberation Front, uh, focused on being out and proud. Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera both uh, were trans women, uh, both um, were marginalized by their family and their community, uh, forced to leave their homes, uh, lived unhoused and unsheltered for periods of time. Uh, both were exploited um, and, and uh, in forced to engage in human trafficking. Um, and both, uh, unfortunately, weren't able to see uh, full and long lives because of the marginalization and the impacts that it had on their lives and their health. But in 1972, they um, came together with a broader group and formed uh, the Gay Activist Alliance that was focused on legal rights. And um, there was sort of this tension already at the time between uh, lesbian and gay men. And at that time, um, transsexual was the phrase, transgender and the concepts of gender were still, uh, the community was still defining themselves. And so there was this separation of gender identity and sexual orientation uh, that was beginning to emerge. Uh, but it's just important and I encourage each of you as you sort of follow up um, to learn a little bit more about Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera if you haven't read about them uh, before. Um, there's some wonderful podcasts with interviews uh, with them. You can hear their voices in real time and some amazing uh, documentaries and others that, uh, that cover them because they're incredible leaders. Uh, and when we think about the Stonewall Inn and the Stonewall Rebellion, today we see a lot of white male faces um, on the photos and the memories of that. Uh, I wanna just center us in a reminder that Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera really were two of the seminal leaders at that time, and it's important to center them as well. So this movement forms to art articulate and advocate for what they're calling gay liberation. At that point in time, gay liberation is an inclusive term that incorporates uh, a broad set of people. The, the specific terms uh, for lesbian and bi and transgender haven't yet emerged. The movement is so new that gay liberation speaks to the liberation of everyone who is um, outside of the social norm, outside of that binary. As we move forward, we get to see more self-definition by communities. But at this time in the early 70s, gay liberation is a broad umbrella term. We can move to the next slide. And it's focused on both social change and then rejecting the dominant heteronormative culture. And this is these are some of the quotes you can see from this time. These are from uh, pamphlets uh, like the Gay Manifesto, which was written in that period. Uh, quotes like, free ourselves, come out everywhere, initiate self-defense and political activity, initiate counter community institutions. Free the homosexual in everyone. We'll be getting a good bit of shift from threatened latents. Be gentle and keep talking and acting free. So the idea is to awaken uh, the community that existed, to give them a space uh, to advocate for themselves, to advocate for their power, um, and to make it socially acceptable to be out, to be a gay person, while also advocating for uh, fair treatment under the law. This is sort of the first uh, burst of activism after the Stonewall riots. Uh, the community begins to assert itself, to identify uh, openly as gay to advocate for this agenda in a way that had not existed before. There had been small, private, secret groups that had formed to advocate, um, but there hadn't been this public awareness. And there was an early tension between those folks who'd been part of those quiet efforts and folks like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who were tired of doing it slowly and quietly, wanted to do it out and proud and loud. And this is the first bursts of this onto the national consciousness. We can advance to the next slide. 
Um, so as we move from gay liberation, we begin to talk about gay rights. And again, in those early days, in late 70s, even into the early 80s, gay rights is also an umbrella term that's speaking to the experiences of people throughout the LGBTQIA uh, plus space. Um, today, and as we imagine it looking back, we know that uh, gay rights was focused on legal protection and recognition from political institutions. Um, at that time, it was also about just the right to be queer, the right to be out, the right to be who we are and live in our society openly and proudly. Uh, those early activists argued that gay marriage was sort of the barrier, that if we could tear down that barrier of gay mar of marriage equality, that that would mean so many other protections. And it's, in fact, uh, a good point. If you look in Washington state law, there are hundreds and hundreds of privileges that attach to the right to marry. Some uh, very concrete, like visiting your spouse in the hospital if they're ill, or taking care of their uh, affairs if they're not able to, um, to starting a family. Also, small rights, like the right to get discounts on certain things uh, from state government and other public institutions. So marriage is important. It's one of those institutions that's been layered with other privileges. And so these early activists uh, really focused on that as one of the big milestones to achieving representation and protection for LGBTQIA people. In addition, there were basic laws on the books at that time that banned same-sex conduct. They were called anti-sodomy laws. The idea, these are coming from uh, English uh, law from the Middle Ages, so are uh, sort of included in um, the, the legal canons when our country was founded, literally making it illegal to engage in same-sex conduct with uh, our partners in our private spaces. Uh, these laws started to become repealed in the 1960s after the Stonewall riots. That movement uh, takes uh, even more uh, uh, front and centered uh, focus. And so we begin to see states repealing anti-sodomy laws in the 1970s. Our state of Washington did not repeal the state's prohibition on same-sex conduct until 1976. So until 1976, it was technically illegal uh, to engage in, uh, in uh, same-sex conduct, uh, to, to express your love for your partner. Uh, that was illegal under state law, but it was repealed in the 1970s. So we begin to see this movement taking foot, uh, advancing this identity, speaking out, continuing to protest, and seeing changes in laws with these anti-sodomy laws being repealed with uh, anti-discrimination laws passed in a couple of cities and this movement continuing to make progress. So inevitably, as we've seen throughout civil rights movements in this country, and we can move to the next slide, there is a backlash uh, to this progress for the LGBTQ community. And we've seen this throughout our history where civil rights movements make progress and there is a pushback. And uh, when you look at the movements for um, for against slavery or the movements for women's suffrage, there is a push and pull where progress is achieved and then the sort of conservative elements, and I don't mean conservative in a, a political party sense, but conservative elements that don't want society to change, pushing back against that change. So that happens uh, in this case as well. 1977, a famous uh, campaign led by a sort of minor celebrity, Anita Bryant, she starts the Save Our Children campaign to argue that the uh, LGBTQ plus movement is, is really going to have a negative impact on children that uh, sort of perpetuating old stereotypes that LGBTQ people are more likely to uh, commit crimes against children. This idea that gay men are pedophiles, uh, building on old stereotypes and outdated uh, co conceptions of LGBTQ uh, people and scaring the general public. So this push and pull begins. Some states, some areas are advancing LGBTQ equality. And now Anita Bryant is leading this campaign against. And so in other states, you see some of this early progress being pushed back. And some cities that had passed anti-discrimination ordinances 
then Anita Bryant's team forcing a vote on that and the public in those cities rejecting uh, that anti-discrimination measure famously happening uh, in some cities in Florida. In Seattle, the measure ended up on the ballot and narrowly was sustained uh, by Seattle voters. But there's this battle taking place around these protections that exist at the time. Also, we see hate crimes against LGBTQIA people. Um, and you know that had happened at a small scale in micro uh, communities around the country as long as LGBTQ people have existed, we know that there's been identity-based violence against them. But with this organized campaign normalizing it, you begin to see uh, really a rise and, and uh, an ability to document uh, this, this hate-based violence. The most public, of course, of this uh, identity-based violence with a uh, culminating in the assassination of one of the the most prominent LGBTQ elected people, elected persons in the country, a San Francisco city commissioner, Harvey Milk, in 1978. So we've made a lot of progress in the 70s. And then now there's this pushback from Anita Bryant, the Save Our Children, and this religious, uh, religiously inspired movement pushing back. We can advance to the next slide. In addition to the um, it, the organized opposition of the religious community, we see a public health crisis emerge at the same time, which is the AIDS crisis. Uh, and the AIDS crisis would really um, lead to negative impacts for the, the particularly gay men, gay and bisexual men in this country, um, because of the way that the HIV virus um, was uh, disproportionately impacting uh, that community. And it led to stigmatization on top of it because of the way that HIV emerged. It first emerged to the public consciousness in July of 1981 as a mysterious cancer that was impacting uh, gay men. And as the researchers delved into it, they were able to identify that these rare cancers were actually a result of um, AIDS because of the impact it was having on uh, gay men's immune systems. They were, these rare cancers were emerging, but it took time for science to catch up to what was happening. But these early cases uh, just were linked and happened, this outbreak happened to start uh, with the, the gay male community. And so that led, uh, if you're thinking about kind of this religious backlash, uh, religious leaders saying that gay identity is a crime, religious identity, religious leaders saying that gay identity, uh, that God will punish this community, this public health crisis could not have been worse, worse in terms of its timing. It really created this perception among those opponents of LGBTQ equality that this was that visible manifestation of what their leaders had been telling them, that this was God punishing this community because uh, of their conduct. And um, you know, as a result, we saw um, a terrible, terrible response from uh, public health officials from the federal level on down. We can move to the next slide. Um, the U.S. government um, failing to act for several years and take this public health crisis seriously. And we actually today in 2021 are living through another public health crisis. And we can look at what the government response has been. Uh, to COVID-19 and, you know, within a few months of the disease being detected, a vaccine being identified and trials being undertaken and, you know, within a year of those first cases of COVID-19 emerging, a widespread vaccination campaigns in this country. Uh, the AIDS crisis is different. 1981, July of 1981, uh, this disease is really publicly identified um, and it's not until 1995 that significant treatment op options are available in uh, 14 years. That gap of progress, that uh, period of marginalization and isolation for many in this community means that in the United States, as of this year, uh, more than 700,000 people died of AIDS. And today in 2021, 1.2 million Americans still live with an HIV infection. Um, so this was a public health crisis um, that was became a political crisis because of inaction by the federal government. And so once again, the LGBTQ community begins protesting. And in the mid 1980s, groups like ACT UP form to undertake really high profile, really aggressive 
uh, protests, uh, staging die-ins where a thousand, hundreds of people, thousands of people would um, park in an intersection in downtown New York or would overwhelm the National Institutes of Health in Washington, D.C. And, and simulate the folks that had died because of inaction and lay down in protest uh, to speak out against uh, what was being done at that, or what wasn't being done at that time. These protests culminate uh, in passage of the Ryan White CARE Act in 1990, again, nine years before we see a comprehensive uh, a solution or comprehensive response from the federal government. Could you imagine if COVID-19, if the government ignored it for nine years, uh, what the response would have been? And that's what we saw in the, in the LGBTQ community. It's also worth noting the marginalization that existed. Ryan White, who the, the act is named after, uh, was a wonderful young man uh, who contracted uh, HIV and AIDS and ultimately died of it because of a blood transfusion. He was not LGBTQ plus though. And so they would not, even in 1990, they chose a non-queer person, a non-LGBTQ person as, um, the, as the sort of person to lift up uh, for why AIDS was a, a priority, further, de or further demonstrating the marginalization, the ignorance of LGBTQ people. So, um, we have religious backlash, a public health crisis, but the same tools of protest, uh, the same tools of coming together are what help the community speak out in this moment of public health emergency and once again begin to coalesce a movement. Once the uh, treatments come out in the mid 1990s and the AIDS crisis, AIDS turns from a death sentence to a chronic condition that can be managed with medication, uh, we begin to see the community organizing again. And we can advance to the next slide. And some of this organized at, you know, pa in parallel to the public health crisis in Berkeley, California in 1984, the city extends its city benefits to uh, partners of their employees. This begins this concept of domestic partnership or of civil unions of how do we get access to the rights and responsibilities of marriage without necessarily calling it marriage yet, uh, a way to sort of incrementally make progress in this space. So uh, 1984, Berkeley, California does it. By the 1990s, city of Seattle, uh, other large cities around the country are doing it. In, this, in the year 2000, the state of Vermont approves a civil union law to give the civil rights of marriage to same-sex couples without calling it marriage. In 2003, the Massachusetts Supreme Court rules that uh, marriage equality uh, is uh, the law under the Massachusetts Constitution, and that begins this movement towards formal marriage equality. In our state, in 2000. Uh, seven, the legislature approved the first domestic partnership law. So it was a statewide act to give um, all LGBT couples in 2007. Uh, and it wasn't all rights of marriage. It was the sort of couple dozen most fundamental rights, the right to visit your partner in the hospital or to care for them uh, if they're unwell. Um, and then in 2008, expanding it and then in 2010, uh, extending it to be, in essence, uh, a civil union law. So in 2010, that measure ended up on the ballot here in Washington. Voters approved uh, that referendum. And then that set the stage for two years later in 2012, the legislature by law approved marriage equality for Washington residents. That also ended up on the ballot. And in the first instance in the United States, voters in 2012 approved marriage equality at the ballot at a statewide level here in Washington. This is part of that continuing movement that culminates in June of 2015 in a 5-4 decision with the U.S. Supreme Court holding that Americans are guaranteed the right to marry as one of the fundamental liberties we are guaranteed under the 14th Amendment. And we can advance to the next slide. Uh, Justice Kennedy, who wrote the majority opinion, writes that there's no union more profound than marriage, uh, for it embodies the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than they once were. And so this uh, is the acknowledgement by the US Supreme Court that our US Constitution guarantees each of us the right to marry our partner under the law. 
So a huge moment when we think back to the 1970s, this is uh, the, the, that early gay rights movement finally summiting Mount Everest that they'd been looking at, that we have now achieved that fundamental right, that fundamental recognition of our unions, of our partnerships, of our existence by our government. And as we learned from the 1970s, what happens next? We can advance to the next slide. Immediately a backlash from conservative elements in our society again. Uh, Justice Scalia writing a, a strong dissenting opinion, calling it a threat to American democracy. The idea that LGBTQIA plus people marrying the people that they love, having that recognition, having those protections is a threat to American democracy. Horrifyingly, uh, horrifyingly hateful language. Of course, uh, we see movements in the Congress to propose a constitutional amendment to ban same-sex marriage, which had been considered earlier, but again, renewed in the aftermath of this. And even our advocates knowing. Uh, James Brenner, who was a plaintiff, and there was a bunch of cases that ended up the Supreme Court. Oberfell versus Hodges was the main one, but James Brenner was a plaintiff in a Florida case who said, uh, you know, it's a dream come true. Now you can get married in Florida, but fired the next day. So there's still a lot of work to do. And that's incredibly right. We reached the summit of this great, uh, this great accomplishment. And just like so many other people who've been mountaineers, once we got to that summit, we realized there was an even bigger set of summits ahead of us. And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit uh, here um, in the next few minutes. So let's advance to the next slide. Uh, the legal achievements in our state, uh, we have made progress beyond marriage equality for a while. We were leading the efforts there. For example, we passed marriage equality before the Supreme Court took action in 2015. In 2006, we passed the Anderson-Murray anti-discrimination law to ensure that LGBTQ people in our state are protected in employment, in housing, throughout our society from discrimination. That law, just a few years ago, ended up in front of the US Supreme Court because our attorney general sued a, a local flower shop for, for declining. She refused to provide flowers for a same-sex uh, wedding celebration. And our attorney general, citing the Anderson Murray anti-discrimination law, sued her to force compliance with the law, ended up in front of the US Supreme Court and our law has been upheld. So example of Washington taking action to help propel this national conversation. We also have codified non-binary markers for legal documents, including uh, birth certificates and driver's license and other places to expand recognition of uh, trans and non-binary people in our society. I wanna continue on the next slide to talk a little bit more about some of the, the things we've done as well. We banned conversion therapy to protect and save youth in our state from that uh, form of abusive treatment uh, that is really tantamount to torture. That law is in court right now uh, with folks trying to challenge it uh, under the First Amendment and religious uh, grounds that with the courts so far upholding it. Um, conversion therapy uh, is another sort of, in addition to uh, marriage equality, which is recognition of um, our unions, of our love, conversion therapy also speaks to this recognition by our government of our right to exist and our right to exist without being labeled as disordered. Up until the early 1970s, the American Psychological Association and other mental health professionals had classified being LGBTQ, being queer as a mental disorder. And so con this conversion therapy ban speaks to um, you know, formally eliminating any possibility, any sense that there's something wrong with being LGBTQ plus from the law, uh, from the way that our government treats us. Um, we also in the criminal justice space have worked to uh, advance protections for trans people against identity-based violence, passing strengthened hate crimes laws in this state. And uh, just a couple of years ago, passing uh, the Nikki Kuhnhausen uh, uh, law to protect against the use of a trans panic defense. There was this old legal concept 
uh, that you could claim you were so upset by discovering someone was LGBTQ or trans that it put you whipped you into a frenzy and you weren't actually able to commit a crime because you were so upset um, that you didn't know right from wrong anymore. And so we have banned any use of that kind of defense to be clear that identity based violence uh, is a crime 100%. And then this year, um, advancing on the health equity space, we passed a, a transformative and, and sweeping law to require that gender affirming care uh, be covered by insurance companies, including our public insurance programs, Medicare or Medicaid and, uh, and Apple Health and others. So uh, one uh, more way of ensuring that more people get access uh, to the treatment and care they need. This is important because um, one study that we cited as we worked on this law showed that rates of uh, suicide and rates of severe mental health complications dropped uh, by you know, significant levels, 25, 30% post treatment for our trans and non-binary folks. When people are allowed to inhabit their bodies in ways that affirm them, it, it ensures that all of us can participate in society uh, without that stigma, without that harm to us. So we have accomplished after marriage equality even more. Washington state continuing uh, to lead the nation, but there continues to be again, that push and pull, we can advance to the next slide, um, that backlash again. And we've seen it in our state, we've seen it across the country with the rise of anti-trans rhetoric. We saw it in the previous administration with, uh, the, with President Trump uh, attempting to push trans service members out of the military, uh, undertaking measures to exclude uh, trans people from participation in healthcare. We see the religious right pushing back under the guise of religious freedom to allow continued discrimination, e even in public contracts where uh, religious organizations are delivering public services like housing or others, uh, trying to get uh, standing to discriminate on the basis of uh, someone's identity. So this backlash, just like it happened in the 1970s, just like it happened, um, you know, after marriage equality continues as we undertake uh, these further measures. We can advance uh, to the next slide. So some of these uh, attacks have manifested in political ways, and we've seen in our state and in states across the country laws introduced, and in, not in our state, uh, but in other states, laws passed uh, to criminalize uh, trans folks using particular bathrooms. In our state, uh, there was a law not to criminalize it, but to, uh, but to erode these protections. And it came to the Senate floor for a vote when we had a Republican majority in the state Senate for a few years. And this anti-trans bill failed just by one vote. Thankfully, we've built a strong pro-equality majority in the Senate since then, but just demonstrating how much this fear and hysteria can spread. Uh, we also now in recent years have seen um, bills that are attempting to ban trans folks participating in sports uh, in their the, the gender that they identify with. Uh, we also know that many of the protections at the national level, so through the federal government, are, folk, are created, are dependent on action by the courts or by executive orders. So uh, President Biden, when he took office in January, reversed a lot of the Trump era um, executive orders against LGBT people and actually passed pro-equality executive orders. Well, because those are dependent on the president, if we see another president elected in the future, they could cancel those uh, orders again. So similarly, court decisions have given some of this, some of these rights, the Supreme Court um, in 2019, 2020, voting on employment protections for LGBTQ people, but an act of Congress could reverse those. And so we want to see action by the Congress on something like the Equality Act, which they're discussing uh, right now, to put these protections into law. And there's a fierce debate over it. In addition, these religious exemptions uh, or religious freedom protections that were passed uh, by Republican Congress and President Trump uh, a couple of years ago are calling into question whether LGBTQ plus people can get treatment at religiously owned hospitals. Here in our state, 
uh, here in the Puget Sound area, many of our hospitals are affiliated with a Catholic church, affiliated, affiliated with a faith-based faith organization. And there's a justifiable fear that if these religious exemptions are allowed to continue, that that means that some LGBTQ people won't be able to access the care that they're entitled to. It's part of why we passed the Gender Affirming Treatment Act this year and why we're trying to create state level protection. But at the federal level, these protections don't exist. And as a result of that, we see a real patchwork of protections for LGBTQ people across the country. If you live in Washington, if you live in California, if you live in New York or Illinois or Massachusetts, you have strong protections, legal protections under state law for the LGBTQ plus community. But if you live in states with different uh, governing philosophies, if you live in Idaho or if you live in Oklahoma or if you live in Arkansas, we're seeing the LGBTQ community at risk because there are not strong national protections, but this state by state uh, framework. The state of Arkansas passing uh, laws to prohibit doctors from providing gender affirming care to trans people, uh, particularly young trans people. So really a, mis a, mis a mishmash. And what that leads to is the LGBTQ community having their rights dependent on their geography. And we know so many queer people um, that, you know, because of life circumstances aren't able to be mobile, are in a community because that's where they grew up or that's where they're caregiving or because they can't afford to move someplace else, uh, really seeing their identity, their freedom, their ability to be who they are um, decided by where they were born rather than by having one standard across the country for how we treat people. We can advance the next slide. Uh, we also see social risks, um, not just the political impacts, but that leads to social impacts as well. Um, the American Medical Association called the anti-trans violence an epidemic, and it's only gotten worse since 2019. We see surveys of trans youth identifying that significant numbers, 54% verbally harassed, 24% physically harassed, 13% sexually assaulted, almost 20% leaving school because of mistreatment. This is unacceptable. And while there's been acceptance for people who look like me, white cis gay men, we know that intersectional identities, being queer in other uh, communities or being queer in some uh, religious communities, some uh, ethnic communities can provide uh, marginalization on top of that. So a lot of challenges remain. So in my final minutes, I just wanna focus on where I see us moving next. So we can advance to the next slide. We need federal protections right away. And I mentioned HR 5, the Equality Act. It has passed the House of Representatives in February and it's stalled in the US Senate. We need to see federal action to enshrine these protections so that LGBTQ people aren't dependent on what state they live in, but have these protections everywhere. Uh, we also need at the state level representatives in place who will fight back against this movement. And here in Washington, we have uh, constructed a pro-equality majority in both the House and Senate of our legislature to ensure that even when bad ideas get introduced, and we've seen lawmakers here in Washington introduce anti-trans bills for bathrooms and sports and other places, and those bills never see the light of day because we have pro-equality majorities. We need to expand that movement across the country to more states. Let's advance to the next slide. And we need more representation in government. So we need more LGBTQ people in positions of prominence, in positions of power, in those policymaking conversations. Folks like Sarah McBride, the first trans state senator in the country elected in Delaware, uh, last year are powerful voices for change. In our state, we have not yet had a transgender Washingtonian in the state legislature. That needs to change. We need more representation. We also need to identify and, and lift up and focus on the intersectional identities. We're so fortunate today uh, to have uh, 
beautiful, amazing women of color who are part of our LGBT caucus in the legislature who are informing us about these intersections. Folks like Kirsten Harris Talley and Emily Randall in the state Senate who are helping us understand the intersections that are here. We also have to find ways to increase sexual accept, social acceptance, not sexual acceptance, social acceptance. And that's where things like comprehensive sex ed in 2020 incorporate into the curriculum uh, who we are, how we live, teaching our students uh, what it means to be LGBTQ so that those who are feel seen and feel safe and those who don't identify understand us and accept us and uh, we can live together. And one final uh, slide. I also wanna talk about coming out. And I think coming out looks different for all of us, but it is an important way uh, that we can declare our identities and really be who uh, we were meant to be in our communities. And I know that not everyone can come out to everyone at, at, at every moment. We have to do this in ways that are safe, that lift us up. And being out to everyone doesn't mean you're more LGBTQ than someone who can't be out, but it is a powerful proclamation of who you are. And I would say coming out to ourselves is the most liberating step and then finding ways to come out to the people around us. That's how we've built acceptance. Polls show, uh, when we did polling on marriage equality, that if a voter knew someone personally who was LGBTQ+, they were 66% uh, likely to vote for marriage equality, and it was about the reverse if they didn't know somebody. So when people know who we are, when folks in our society can identify with us and our stories, that's what builds exception, except uh, that's what builds uh, our uh, welcomeness. That's what builds our ability to make progress. Uh, that's what build ex builds acceptance. And it's what will get us to where we need to be. So let's pass laws, let's get representative, and let's come out as much as we can. That is the moral of the story after uh, marriage equality passed. And with that, I will pass it back to Kenton and we will. Um, take a little break and look forward to your questions soon. Yes, yeah, thank you so much, Senator Leas. Uh, it was wonderful to hear uh, your full presentation about kind of the past, uh, present, and the future of what queer politics looks like in Washington and in our country. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, so uh, uh, we, I think, are now ready to get started with our Q&A with our presenter. So remember that um, you can still add your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen if you haven't already, um, and we will go ahead and get started. So um, I can go ahead and read off the first one. So our first question that's in the Q&A right now says, uh, Hello, Senator Leas. I follow your work and thank you for the influence you have had in making progress on the rights for LGBTQIA plus folks within our state, which I have directly benefited from. Can you share your politics and approach to influencing and changing the course of history by ensuring that the urgent need for racial justice is intertwined in your work for LGBTQIA plus rights and policy, which historically has either excluded or decentered racial justice policy, thereby further reinforcing white supremacy embedded in the advancement of white LGBTQIA plus people. Uh, this is not a new historical pattern. The same decentering of the needs of the BIPOC communities occurred during women's rights, which advanced white women's rights at the cost of people of color, etc. Uh, thank you for your insights on an intersectional approach to L LGBTQIA plus rights for everyone. That's a, a great question. And I think, you know, in the lecture, we talked a little bit about that with how we've even whitewashed the story of Stonewall in 1969 and really erased Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera for decades. So I think part of it is first just acknowledging and being explicit uh, that this has happened and that we have we do need to center uh, on the voices of those who are most marginalized within our community, which means tackling intersectional challenges. So I think being honest, being upfront, and lifting this up is the first step. I think depending on where you're at in, um, in this journey, I think for, for white folks, this is about learning about anti-racism and doing the work on our own to understand the structures of oppression that exist today that have existed throughout our history and what our role is both in perpetuating those and in taking them on. And I think one of the most important things I've learned as a leader is to just be open and questioning and ready to take on new information. So when I hear, for example, the experiences of people of color, marginalized folks in the community, rather than trying to explain 
uh, the situation, just being open to understanding that people are coming from different perspectives. So I think if for our white folks out there, let's do anti-racist work. I know that Highline has some great programs and opportunities for folks to engage in how to become an anti-racist advocate. And then for our BIPOC communities, I think this is a moment where we need more representation. We need folks who are ready and willing to step forward and help us lead through this. You know, historically we've had a white led movement and that just is not gonna solve these problems. We need intersectional leaders like Kirsten Harris Talley uh, in the House of Representatives here in Washington or Emily Randall in our state Senate who can bring with them these lived experiences to help us tackle uh, this, uh, this, these intersecting challenges. Um, and then the, the sort of final thing I will say is LGBTQ people comprise a minority of the population. So our rights have always been dependent on solidarity with other marginalized voices. So we need to be in solidarity with our communities of color. We need to be in solidarity uh, with other marginalized communities to make sure that our rights are protected. It's why I also am uh, proudly a feminist. We've got to make sure that everyone has rights to reproductive care. If the government can control women's bodies or reproductive people's bodies, it's not too far from where they can control all of our bodies. So we need to be in solidarity with others fighting for justice. Um, and so those are some of the things I would say in my approach. And I think that all of us can sort of work on and focus on as we move forward. Perfect. Thank you so much. And then I'll pass it over to Doris for our next question. All right, thank you, Senator Elias, for being here with us this afternoon. Uh, I have a question to you from one of our students in the audience. Uh, the question states, I learned so many things I didn't know about the struggles facing the LGBTQI plus community. How can myself and others become more involved in supporting the community? Well, I would just say first, attending this week's uh, week of activities is a great first step. So I wanna just applaud you for stepping in and taking the time to come to these activities. I know Highline has a few more activities planned over the course of the rest of the week. So uh, take ad uh, advantage of those, participate in those. I think you'll see uh, new and different lenses. I also just blanket advice to folks who wanna get involved in making change is find organizations that are making change and join them. So in Washington state, we have a great group called Equal Rights Washington. Uh, and if you, you Google search them, you'll find that, them as an organization. They are at the intersection of LGBTQ liberation, but also doing it with an intersectional lens as we talked about uh, in response to Aisha's question. So I think joining Equal Rights Washington is a great way to get plugged in. They will tell you about what's happening at the local and state level. We also have some great national organizations. And I don't want to uh, give preference to one over the other. There's many that are working in the trans space and the LGBT space, focused on women, focused on men, focused on other parts of the community. So find those organizations uh, that are making a difference. And then find that community at Highline. I know that there is uh, student organizations and organizing on campus. Find other people who are doing this work uh, and, and create that sense of community and solidarity together. Those are the things I would say um, are early ways uh, that you can get more involved in supporting the community. And some of those are really easy, like get on ERW's email list. That doesn't take a lot of work. You'll get a few emails. You'll learn about it over time. Becoming engaged in face-to-face -face organizing and community may take a little bit more of our time. So find that space on the spectrum uh, that fits what you've got available. And don't let anybody tell you you're not a good member of the LGBTQ community because you didn't do things one way or the other. There are so many ways to make change, find your way to do it and engage with your community in ways that build us all up and lift us all up. Thank you so much. Perfect. Um, I have another question for you that um, actually I think uh, will kind of build off of that one a little bit. So the timing works great. So uh, my question for you is, uh, as an openly LGBTQ plus politician, how did you uh, personally get into politics? And what would be your advice for other queer and trans folks looking to engage in politics, uh, activism and advocacy work? It's part of why I say there's really no 
right way to do it. I got involved in politics, not originally because of my queer identity. I was involved uh, through other sort of aspects of who I am. I was a small business owner and uh, lived in my community for my whole life and ran for the city council because I just wanted to help contribute uh, to the community and to making a better place for me and my family to live in. When I got to the legislature is the first time I really engaged with queer politics. And for me, it was the realization that if it, there was only seven of us in the legislature that were LGBT, if I didn't do my share, if I didn't do my work, our whole community couldn't move forward. And so that's why I really want to emphasize that there are so many ways uh, to make change. And I see a comment from Stephanie about how political involvement being risky for some people or having its own um, marginalizing and negative impacts. I totally agree. There's no right way to be an advocate for justice. I think we all need to step up and do our part, our, our the part that we can do. And maybe that means joining an email list and just reading for a little while. Maybe it means talking to your best friend about what you can do in your small friend group to advance justice. Maybe it means running for office. Maybe it means you know becoming like Malala Yousafzai and becoming a, an international spokesperson. There's so many spaces on this spectrum where people uh, can speak out. And I, I just wanna emphasize that there's no wrong way to do it. The only thing that I really wanna discourage us from doing is nothing. I think complacency and invisibility are what will hurt our movement. And let's find safe and accepting ways of being out, of doing our work. And like I said, joining an email list is a pretty safe way as a first step. Uh, those are private email lists. No one's gonna know you're on it. That's a great way to just get engaged. So do something, whether it's small and safe and it's a tiptoe into it, or do something big. That whole spectrum is equally valid and each of us has to engage in a way that's safe for us and is meaningful for us without you know, doubling down on marginalization and trauma that we've experienced. Thank you so much. I think uh, in regards to Stephanie's question, just diving deeper into it, I'll just read it out loud for folks who may have not seen it. Um, political involvement feels unrewarding or even abusive for many, especially people for from systemic non-dominant groups. Um, political structures were created and are continually recreated to enforce oppression to exclude political participation or power. What other ways can individuals effectively pressure political structure and discussions when voting on uh, or government roles are an option? Yes, and that's, I, I think, exactly where sort of community uh, and and sort of engaging in your community, whatever that definition is for you, is a really powerful way to make change. So that may be being a visible advocate within your faith community. It may mean being a visible advocate within your family uh, for the LGBTQ space. It may be just coming out to yourself uh, as a first step for today, for this week, for this month. So I do think that Political activism is one way to make change. We also see within the business community and, and corporate structures, there's employee resource groups at a lot of our large companies where employees of Amazon or Microsoft or Boeing rally together to push their company to move equality forward. And we've seen in other states where business, the business community has helped the queer community to defeat anti-LGBTQ measures. So there's NGOs, there's the faith community, there's within your work and your space there, your learning community here at Highline, like there's so many places and I don't, I don't want to sound like they all are equally powerful or they all are equally meaningful. I don't want to be blase about that. I just want to suggest that each of us can find ways that are suited to where we are, what's safe for us in this moment to get engaged. I also, um, I believe that there is a critical mass of folks in our government that want to make change systematically. So it is true that our government was created by white men for the benefit of other white men. We are seeing today just a huge change with folks getting elected to office and folks pressing on the government 
to be more inclusive and equitable. And so I don't want folks to just give up on political structures. It may not be the right way for you right now because of your lived experience, but I also believe that in our democracy, each of us does have to want, find ways to step up. And maybe that means joining with another organization. If you uh, don't feel like you wanna directly engage with the government, that's very valid, but Equal Rights Washington or uh, the, the um, Oasis Center in Tacoma or uh, Black Trans Women's Collective Organizations. There's so many other ways to engage. Um, I think all of us should find those ways that are safe for us and meaningful for us. Uh, to be engaged. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, another question that we uh, have in the Q&A is uh, another from Aisha. Uh, she asks, how do we get involved with the intersectional task force that you mentioned earlier in your presentation? So the um, LGBTQ plus commission uh, in state government is sort of the place that we're doing a lot of this intersectional work um, in, uh, in the government. Um, so the LGBTQ plus commission, and I think Kenton and, and Doris, maybe we can share that uh, a link out or some resources on how to get engaged there. We've got uh, about a dozen commissioners, I think 15 commissioners from around the state that meet and advise state government. That's where a lot of that intersectional conversation is going. And we've intentionally, those commissioners reflect the diversity of the LGBTQ community. So we've got gender and racial and geographic and and even the, the sort of beautiful letters of the LGBTQIA spectrum are represented on that commission. In addition, I would say Equal Rights Washington for a non-governmental voice is doing this intersectional work led by uh, a constituent of mine, uh, an amazing Black woman who is trying to bring racial justice and equality as a lens for their LGBTQ organizing. So those are two, Equal Rights Washington and the LGBTQ Commission and state government are two places that I would direct people where this great work's being done and there should there are ways to engage there. Yes, I, Ying says, what do commissioners mean? It's a, a, a phrase for the folks who are appointed as board members or are sort of permanent, uh, they, they participate for a three or four year period um, on the LGBTQ commission, we call them commissioners. So there's 15 of them that have been appointed, but they have a lot of public dialogue, public organizing um, where they're engaging the broad community as well. So that's a good entry point. Perfect, I see. Edwina and Doris putting links. So thank you for helping me with that. Yeah, thank you so much for your responses thus far. And uh, we still have a little bit of time left. So if anybody else um, in our audience today has questions that you would like to add to the Q&A, uh, feel free to do so. And we'd be more than happy to address those. While we wait, I have one, if that's okay. Um, Senator Leas, you sound like a very busy person. So for folks like you that are championing, um, you know, in our community, how do you unwind and take care of yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it varies different times of the year. So I have, um, my, my family, my people come from Scandinavia. So I get uh, seasonal depression. And so this dark period of the year, it's for me, it's just like giving myself permission to just take a little bit more time to do tasks and, you know, just being gentle on myself. Uh, I do love to travel. I love to go particularly to places that are sunny. I think because we get so much gray here. So um, I'm going to go on a work trip to Phoenix next week, get some sun, see a slightly different place. I love to do that. And then I love to cook and bake. So um, for me, like that, I get to go into autopilot a little bit while I'm cooking and I can take my mind off of everything else and just focus on the onions in front of me or the bread dough in front of me and and unplug. Um, and then I also watch shows and read and have recently gone into like, I'm not a gamer because that's like way, way above my pay grade, but I like some kind of I have civilization six and some kind of like strategy games. So those are some of the things I do, but um, it is, it can be hard and overwhelming at times. And I think it's okay sometimes to just acknowledge that and give ourselves space, give myself space to just be how I'm feeling today. Thank you for that.
I also should say I have some great people who help me in my work. And in particular, I have a great legislative assistant named Jeremy Knapp, who wrote a thesis for his, his uh, undergrad degree earlier this year on some of the same themes that this lecture was on. So he helped me a huge amount in pulling together all the information. So um, usually when you see someone with a fancy title like Senator, I, there's a bunch of other amazing people working together with us to do all this work. So I just wanna lift up our LGBTQ staffer, Jeremy, for all his help in pulling this all together. He even designed those slides so they look so pretty. So um, there's some great people that help me do my work too. Yes, absolutely. And Jeremy is also here in the meeting with us today. So yes, thank you so much, Jeremy, for your assistance as well. <laughs> Alrighty, so uh, it doesn't look like we have any more uh, questions in the Q&A at the moment, so I think we can go ahead and um, wrap things up. So yeah, thank you all um, so much for joining us for today's event. Uh, later today, we will be wrapping up LGBTQIA plus week with another fantastic event. At 3 p.m. today, we will be having a film viewing of Kumuhina and a discussion of the film. So we hope to see you all there. Thank you once again to our presenter, Senator Marco Elias, for sharing your time and your knowledge with us today. And we hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.